so much <clears throat> to reflect and think about as we are in two or three weeks post the resurrection of Jesus and uh, the state of the world continues to be overrun and quite frightening, if you will, as it pertains to all the kinds of challenges that we face as a people and as a country, dare I even say, as a creation. Uh, but we know, and I do believe, that there are ways that we are called to show up as resurrected people in spite of all of these realities. And I hope to spend a little time opening up our lectionary passage that gives to us, I think, a wonderful, wonderful offering for what does it mean to embody a love that transforms amidst all the hatred and the violence that is palpable. And so First John is going to be our biblical text today. Uh, just to give you a little background about First John, it is thought to have been written by uh, John the Apostle, or, you know, some folks attribute it to uh, another early church leader named John. But what is great about this particular author is that it is often thought that this letter was written while John was incarcerated. As a matter of fact, it's worth saying that much of the biblical text was likely written while those individuals who were sharing this good news were under the thumb, if you will, of the empire. Their quote unquote freedom was not particularly extended to them. It gives me to know, and I was reflecting on this on the plane the other night that sometimes you can be in a very difficult season or situation and yet God can still turn something into a magnanimous gift to everyone. That your situation does not overdetermine your reach. As a matter of fact, sometimes it can fuel the power and the relevance of that revelation, that activity that God is doing in our lives. And so the book of John is another great example of how God can use you wherever you are. Hello, somebody. Anybody happy God can use you wherever you are? Amen. You could be on a mountain high. You could be in a valley low. You could be full of power and confidence, or you can be a little doubtful and concerned about your circumstances and God can inhabit wherever you are and use you in a way that will even blow your own mind. So one of the gifts I think of this passage is to open up a theme that is certainly within the Yohanan literature, the, the books that John is attributed to writing in First John chapter 3 will be our source for today. The scripture says, this is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us, and this is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers, and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing. What happens to God's love? It disappears. This is a very powerful, powerful declaration. That if your brother or sister is in need and we have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? it disappears. I was really struck by this idea that the love of God that is eternal disappears when we who are the followers of Jesus have it to give, but we hold it back. The love of God, which is eternal, disappears when we, God's people, refuse to give it out when we have it within our capacity. Verse 18, my dear children, so let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. For this is the only way we'll know we're living truly. 
living in God's reality, it's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. And friends, once that's taken care of, we're no longer accusing or condemning ourselves. We're bold and free before God. We're able to stretch our hands out and receive what we asked because we're doing what God said and we're doing what pleases God. Again, this is God's command to believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ. For God told us to love each other in line with the original command and when we keep God's commands. We live deeply and surely in God, and God lives in us. And this is how we experience the deep and abiding presence in us by the Spirit God gave us. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God, everyone. We're going to speak from the topic today, relearning love relearning love god we thank you for the word that has been read for us the people of god we ask you to hide your word in our hearts and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy may it rest on me and even the hearers of your word and we'll say thank you god for the love that we must relearn in jesus name we pray let us all say amen now, if we are honest with ourselves and certainly with one another, we can say without equivocation that life has taught us that not all forms and sources of love are created equal. How many of you can go back into the recesses of your mind? Some of you are young enough where you may still be in it, where you had your first boyfriend, your first girlfriend, the first love of your life. Anybody remember that? Amen. I, I, I have been working with young people most of my uh, adult life and even into my young adult life and perhaps even in my teenage life. And I have always watched from a distance uh, or certainly from some proximity uh, of, you know, the way young people uh, get connected and hooked up and start dating in high school, junior high, and college. And it seems that the first taste of that love is the sweetest taste that's ever known. And uh, there is such investment and such uh, 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 emotional attachment to the initial experience of what they or we would call love. Without getting too, you know, transparent about, you know, uh, my own kind of familial network, praise God, there are those who are experiencing their first bout of puppy love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope you pray for all the individuals involved. Amen, because I don't like dogs that one. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. But I realize that it's one thing to experience this kind of relational development as a mentor, as a youth pastor. It's another thing to experience as a caregiver of someone else. And it's another way to experience as someone who's involved in it themselves. And over the course of time, if we're honest and if we are growing and maturing, we can get to a point in our journey and acknowledge that there are things I thought I knew about love at various seasons of my life that I would not describe that way today. Mm -hmm. Life has taught us that not all forms of love, not all sources of love are equal. Mm -hmm. And you can experience real love <laughs> and not appreciate it 
and it can slide through your hands like sands in the hourglass, experiencing the days of our lives. But if you and I are honest today, how many can acknowledge that there are some ways of love we've learned that deserve to be unlearned? And there are some ways of giving love that deserve to be ended. Period. <laughs> Done. And what I find to be so fascinating, particularly about we who follow the ways of Jesus, is that we can have a certain orientation to how we are to embody the love of God shown to us through Christ Jesus and never interrogate, is this the way I'm called to love in this current context in which we live? That there are seasons of our lives that require a certain expression of love that we may have to learn how to do. Because the reality is, some of the kind of love that is required, we've never been taught. I mean, you know, I deal with a lot of various kinds of folks in, in church, outside of church, and. It's really fascinating how we all can use the same word love, but mean so many different kinds of things. There's a kind of love that would suggest you ought to give your everything for someone who gives you nothing in return. There's a kind of love that locks some of us into relationships that are toxic, abusive, and devoid of life. There are some kinds of love that make us so wedded to an idea or a thing that when the idea or thing ceases to be life-giving, we still remain wedded to that thing or idea. It's all kind of loves out here. And I want to suggest to you, beloved, that one of the most important things for we who follow the ways of Jesus is to always invite ourselves to interrogate our love. Is the love I have for God and the love I know God has for me a kind of love that when unleashed into the world produces a similar kind of result that does no harm, that creates the conditions for life, and dare I say that brings the best out in me and the person I'm attempting to love. Now, it's easier said than done because, you know, I follow, you know, at least I believe I've been following Jesus for most of my life and I don't get it right as often as I want to. You know, I sit in meetings with folk and they've been shady towards me and, and I can be a petty, <laughs> petty brother. <laughs> Somebody say man. And you know, my pettiness is, uh, I try to be nonviolent in my pettiness as much as I possibly can. You know, I certainly not knock nobody upside the head, but how many know there's a way to be not a, vi a petty and still cause harm? <laughs> Even if you're not violent. And I've not always been the best partner in relationships. I've not always been the best father. I've not always been the best pastor. I've, I, 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 I've, I've reflected over the course of my life over the last week or so as I was preparing for this message and just thought about the many ways I've heard love preached my whole life and still I have a ways to grow. And it made me ask the question, what is so difficult about love? 
Because don't we all love love? Love. We just love it. Songs being written about love. I mean, books being written. I mean, all of us are looking for love in all the wrong and right places. Even Buck, we said, nooking no love. He was he just, <laughs> lo, 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 love is something nobody's arguing about love. Oh, we don't, nobody's like, wait, I don't want love. I don't want to be loved. Nobody's walking around just saying that. Everybody's looking for love, but love still seems to be elusive. Am I talking to any real folk in here today? And it makes me wonder, what is it about the way we follow Jesus that we can say without any hesitation that Jesus is love? Oh, folks don't even follow Jesus. They be asking you church people, How, why are you so full of hate when Jesus is love? <laughs> Do you believe Jesus? No, I don't believe in Jesus, but I'm asking you. Because you say Jesus is love, but we can be so difficult to exhibit this love. What I have found, particularly in this text, to be very fascinating uh, is this verse. Uh, I, I read the message translation, but I want to read this particular verse in the New Revised Translation, which just simply says it. Like this, it says, let us love not in word or speech, is verse number 18, but in truth and action. Let us not just throw around the word love and have it devoid from actions and truth now both of those words can be particularly challenging because in a world where truth is contested remember uh, alistair mcintyre in my philosophy class at duke we talked about whose justice and whose rationality this idea that while we all use similar words for justice or use similar words for for, for, for uh, the values, the virtues, if you will, uh, that there are indeed a certain kind of contestation around which forms of justice, which forms of mercy, which forms of peace and love prevail in a conversation among people who may not start in the same place. As a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, as a pastor, I want to suggest to you that, yes, we are a people who want to always embrace and pursue truth. But we can at times put emphasis on dogma, on doctrine, on philosophical and theological claims, and not put enough emphasis on ethics. Which is just to say, we all have our personal convictions, our dogma, our dogmatic principles, the things hopefully that guide us. But there are, and there continues to be a significant wrestling we must always have between that which we believe and how we actually apply it. Dogma is belief. Ethics is application. Dogma is what I am convinced of. Ethics is how I live that out in the real world. Dogma that supplants ethics puts us in situations where we compromise our capacity for faithful application. Which is just to mean that all the things that I'm sure of when it lives in a real world, how many of you know sometimes it don't always fit very cleanly? I'm just going to talk to you a little bit today about the nuancing of this 
idea called love. Now, in the biblical text, what's so powerful is that, you know, there are at least three words that are commonly used to describe or refer to love in the text. In our English language, we use the same love, but it is often inferred by the use of the love, uh, word love, of what kind of love we're talking about. If I say, I love the 49ers, which I do, it is very different than me say, I love my mama in there, which is also different than saying, I love my boo. Now, if all three are the same in your mindset, I want to argue that may be a problematic application of love. <laughs> How many know you can run into some problems if you love your boo as much as you love your 49ers? <laughs> and it can be a problem if you love your mama and them more than you love your boo. When you, you know, eventually got partner up for death do us part and all these. <laughs> I never forget, it's like, you, you know, nobody, well anyway, I'm, let me keep going. <laughs> Three kinds of love in the biblical text. Filio, which stands for brotherly, familial friendship. So when you read love in the biblical text, it won't say love the way we see it. It will, in the original text, say filio, which meant that just like we can tell by the context, so could the readers and the hearers tell that when the scriptures are inviting a kind of love, familiar or attached to family, it is distinct from the use of the other word for love in the text, which is eros, E-R-O-S, which is attributed to the love of desire and sexual erotic kinds of engagements. And then there's a love that is in this biblical text that it refers to agape which is in our tradition the highest form of love it is unconditional it is transcendent it is a love that transforms now one of the great gifts that i find about following jesus is that jesus gives us the opportunity to be in relationships with one another that cause our Highest forms of love to literally transform the kind of love we share in every part of our life. Because it is so important to appreciate that as I follow Jesus, I ought to be a better family member. <laughs> I mean, that just stung us a little bit, right? Some of us come to church our whole life and nobody in our family would even attribute the way you follow Jesus to translating to how you treat your family. Or the kind of love that it, it informs your romantic and your, your relationships with those whom you are pledging lifelong kinds of commitments. That should inform that kind of love as well. And so back to my earliest point, if we're all looking for love, why is love so elusive? Well, I do believe that there is a very powerful kind of continuous description in this text that gives to you and I a wonderful opportunity to ask ourselves, if I must unlearn some ways of love, what are the ways of love I must relearn? Or dare I say, start to learn because I love the first line in the text for today it is very powerful it says that we know love by this everybody say that to me say we know love by this say it again we know love by this. one more time we know love by by this. In the Greek word, the word for no, gnosko, means that it is something you come to learn. I know there's some smart people in here, but I bet you there's some things you had to be taught in order to learn. Is 
isn't it fascinating that every child comes to the world with lots of genetic inherited traits, but there are still things that they must learn by watching, by hearing, by experiencing. And I remember when my girls were young, before they knew how to talk, they knew how to use my phone. <laughs> it was very intuitive for them to do things to my phone that I could not do. Ways that they would lock my phone up and I had to call <laughs> the store <laughs> to just get my phone back open again. They came to learn by doing. And can you imagine how much we've learned by doing that we can acknowledge has not been helpful? It was tough for me too. I was like, Lord, why, 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 why am I going here? We know love by this. Some of us know love by what we have done. But isn't, hasn't some of that love been dangerous? I remember talking to a young sister in, in the schools and you know, she was in love with you know, her teenage uh, boyfriend and you know, he was trying to get her to move weight for her, you know, drugs, stuff like that. She's like, oh, but, you know, Pastor Mike, I love him. I said, girl, <laughs> that, 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 that's not the kind of love that you need to be holding on to as a definition. But isn't it true that many of us you know, it's easy to look at the young, oh, these young people. What are we doing with the young people? You know, it's like, oh, young people. Oh. oh, these young people. But how many of us work on a job and we get asked to do things that we know, hmm? Or how many of us, you know, participate in activities, you know, it's, hmm? <laughs> or how many of you just, you know, be by yourself and be like, hmm? And ain't it interesting that you're so easy on yourself, but you're not easy on the young people. There's something about young people that just really makes some of us really get a little bitter and angry and upset. It, it, it's kind of like, you know, uh, I, I, my student loans got forgiven. You know, about six months ago, a year ago, it's like $90,000, you know, Forgiven. So I'm like, well, and you still hard on, on Biden? Yes, I am. I'm hard on him, a comma, because, you know, $90,000 is a lot of money, but, you know, I wasn't going to pay it back anyways. So like, nah. <laughs> it's just the cost of doing business up in here. Somebody say, man. But, you know, because I worked for 10 years in a, you know, nonprofit and working with, you know, they, they just said, you know, you get your little loans forgiven. I said, well, thank the Lord. I mean, I wasn't paying, I mean, I was paying it, but it was like, I get to keep that $200 a month now, I don't know. But when you know student loan forgiveness comes up, people just get all in their feelings. Oh, why would you forgive their loans? I had to pay my loans back. <laughs> it's kind of how we are with the kids. Oh, you, you young people. Why are you so disobedient knowing that you are a piece of work, it ain't a was, it still are. You a grown kid with the same kind of foibles. Hello, somebody. It is fascinating to me that there are moments in life where the love we've learned deserves to be discontinued. We got to learn a new way of loving in the world, why? Because I look at our country and the world, and I look at the way people are attributing love of country to warmongering. Oh, I love my country, and so because I love my country, then I'm going to bomb this country out of a love for my country. And I'm like, hmm, that 
that's not the way Jesus taught us to love. But yet these folk are demonstratively loud by following Jesus. Maybe ask a question, how can I say I love Jesus and be a warmonger? Or, you know, let's bring it on home a little bit. I'm, I'm going to get to my three points. It's going to be real quick three points. Amen. I promise you. I just had to unpack a few things. There, are, there are, 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 are some of us who know that Jesus hung out. Friends, for now, I caught him with the wretched of the earth. And Jesus was hanging out with, you know, with the well-to-dos. Matter of fact, most of the well-to-dos found Jesus quite to be a conundrum, especially if the well-to-dos had power. Because Jesus' way of loving people exposed their own hypocrisy. Jesus' way of loving people, listen, exposed how their dogma was disconnected from their ethics. Jesus, just by the way he lived, you know, Jesus was quite the revolutionary in that Jesus didn't need a pistol or an army to turn his whole society upside down. But you look at many of us in our country, we just approved $60 billion to fund more wars. And it threw in about $9 billion that our Congresswoman Barbara Lee and many others had to finagle to get into a package. And then this is what the Democrats and Republicans did. The Republicans didn't have enough money to, I'm sorry, enough votes to pass the $60 billion. The Democrats didn't have enough votes to pass the $9 billion. So some of the Democrats and some of the Republicans got together and said, we're going to approve $60 billion in this bill to bomb people. Offensive weapons, not defensive weapons, but offensive weapons, guided missiles, bunker burster bombs to Ukraine, to Israel, and we're going to give you $9 billion. So as we drop $60 billion of bombs on you, we'll give you $9 billion of food. And the reason why so many people voted for it is because they love their country. And it makes me keep asking myself, God, am I supposed to love my country? So much that I'm okay with bombing other people. I mean, it sounds just, you know, Pastor Mike, that's so crazy, but you know, we, you know, we didn't even know we work with a, uh, Pookie and Ray Ray and all the loved ones in the neighborhood. Somebody say, man, Jose, Maria, you know. And many of them are in conflicts that go back generations. And the only reason they continue to participate in these conflicts is because of a deep love. Could be familial love. You took out my aunt, you took out my uncle, so I'm going to take you out. As soon as I take you out, then that person's cousin or nephew or son or is now about to be intergenerationally in a conflict with you. And all of us who get caught up in the conflicts, now we mad. Oh, these young people. Why can't they work out their problems without violence? Ain't that what we say? And this is in our response. We need to hire more police who are definitely the most peaceful government institution in our society to help these violent individuals make peace. And many of us in the familiar networks of so many of these actors love Jesus. Could it be beloved that we've learned love the wrong way? Three points. Love is sacrificial, not exploitative. One of the things we have to relearn about love is that it is inherently sacrificial. The scripture says it like this. 
We know love by this that Jesus laid down his life, sacrificial, for us. Let me stop right there. Life in the Greek stands for psyche, or it is, I'm sorry, in the Greek, the word psyche, which just is not about your physical well-being or your physical body, but it is also about your mind, your heart your way of thinking. There is a kind of love that requires us to start to interrogate how we show up in the world. Very few of us are going to be asked to sacrificially lay down your life for another person. Very few. Many of us, you know, oh, I, I die for you. And for some of us, there are some folk in our life we would probably... If push comes to shove, you know, hey, I'm, I'm about this life. You know, you, you, my, you my mom, dad, you, you got these certain wife, partner, you got these relationships. I, you know, I, I'm expected, I'm, a, I'm willing to go, go, to the, go to the grave for you. But how many know there's other ways of living sacrificially with your neighbor that does not require you to give up your physical life? There are ways politically, economically, socially that we can live in relationship with one another sacrificially without giving up your life. <laughs> Hello, somebody. There are ways you and I could say, you know, I'm going to vote in a way. I'm going to show up in a way. I'm going to mentor in a way. I'm going to take some, some, some extra little burdens on in a way. Why? Because this is what love of, from God compels me to do. Living sacrificially, not exploitatively. Meaning that there is <laughs> the threat of sacrificial love turning into exploitation. Where, anybody ever met takers? People, they just take. Take, 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 take. And they'll, they'll take everything from you and still keep asking for more. You don't got nothing left? <laughs> nothing? But I still need more. Well, those folk you leave to God. The one who has abundance. The one who never runs out. Again, the scripture operatively words says, if you have it within your means. Which means that there are some boundaries about how you live sacrificially. Particularly when we are surrounded by people who are dispositioned in the world as takers. It is not a necessarily uh, pejorative description. It is just to say that there are some of us at seasons of our lives who only God can help. But it is still our responsibility to give love to them. Right? Right? To not despise them. To not continuously throw up in it. Oh, honey, I've given you to God. <laughs> I mean, that's not a loving response. <laughs> can you help me? No, I, I've given you to God, bruh. <laughs> Only God can help you. It's like, man, I, I, that God don't sound like he trying to help me. Can we keep it 100? How, how many can be honest? I've talked to folk that way. You done got on my last nerve. I gave you my last everything, and you still ask for more? You kind of, you know, that, that part of you just got riled up, and you made it very clear to them stop asking me for more love. I don't got nothing to give you. That's our humanness, but we ought to be cognizant of it, right? A person who's not cognizant of their boundaries will drift into abuse. And God is not abusive. So there are some no's that we can say and still show love. 
Love without manipulation. Love without exploitation. What does it mean then, beloved, to have love that decenters your ego, your power, the kind of power that wants to lord over people, your privilege, your profit motive? Woo. How many of us know that we love our money? And if it don't make money, <laughs> I don't know who taught that. I, I didn't find that in the Bible anywhere. I don't know who taught you that. <laughs> I don't think that was one of my Bible study lessons. But ain't it something that we all know that edict, that dogma? And yet we're called by God to love sacrificially. Does not that create within you a little bit of discomfort? I mean, it does for me. Every time I read the scriptures and have time to contemplate, I get a little uncomfortable. Man, did Jesus really mean this when he said that? Or was Jesus trying to sound deep and moral and righteous and holy? Love your neighbor. You don't know my neighbor, Jesus. My neighbor. My neighbor. <laughs> Love is sacrificial, not exploited. First thing. Second thing you need to unlearn, or we need to learn and unlearn. Love is redemptive. Yes. Listen to this. And not overly punitive. This week I was in uh, Boston. I was at Harvard with some, some, some comrades and friends. We were talking about uh, collateral consequences. Collateral consequences are the kinds of punishments that follow those individuals who've been convicted of a crime under the U US legal code. And I gotta always be that descriptive, right? Because how many know crime changes <laughs> over time? They now pass a law that said it's a crime to teach black history. Did you know that? They making it illegal to teach black history. That's why Dr. King back in the 60s said, you and I have a moral duty to disobey an unjust law. Hello, somebody. Jesus was a criminal. Did you know that? Oh, I know we love Jesus so what is that? So meek and lowly, so humble and holy. Jesus broke the law regularly. <laughs> Just telling you now. <laughs> they told Jesus not to heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said, it's the Sabbath. Who need to be healed? Let me, come on, come on, line on up. <laughs> come on, it's, it's time to break some laws. Jesus was the original Robin Hood up in this joint, right? She's like, hey, hey you, you got an unjust law? I'm here to break it. I hope some of you ready to break some unjust laws. Because with the Supreme Court packed the way it is, and with some of these lower courts getting packed the way they are, you better get ready to break an unjust law. And you can quote Pastor Mike on that. What's today? April the 21st, the day after 420. Can I talk about 420 for a second? I'm from the city where they say don't give me no bam or weed. Somebody say amen, right? I was in New York on my way to the uh, uh, Penn Station to go catch a train. And I was standing on the corner. And I remember the first time I came to New York about 15 years ago, it just felt so bizarre to me. Down to all of it, just like, well, this is lights and... But they had police down there, and they was arresting every black person you could see who was out there on the corner. I assume they were selling drugs. I assume stop and frisk. You know, that was the whole thing back then. They would stop you, go through your pockets. If you had weed or drugs on you, boom, in the paddy whack. They had a lot of paddy whack. This is back in, you know, the early 2000s. That recent. Wow. I'm there. I'm like, man, this is wild. This is crazy. I was in New York two weeks ago, and I, I, I'm getting ready to cross the street. And I smell a sound, a smell, a, 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 a aroma I'm 
familiar with. <laughs> Living here in the Bay Area, just go outside. <sighs> it's just everywhere. Somebody say amen, right? Just familiar with it. But, and it was coming from a food truck selling weed. And I immediately fought back to standing on this same corner 15, 20 years ago watching young black men get arrested for selling weed. 15 years later, a food truck with a big old marijuana leaf on the side. I said to myself, crime changes. There are people today still in jail and prison for weed. Can you, uh, Lord, I got to keep going. But can you imagine someone who's been in jail for 20 years coming home and walk down Broadway and just looking at cookies and stuff all right? Like, <laughs> Am I, did I, I went into one world and I came out to another world. There is a punitiveness in our society. Disproportionately handed out to certain groups of people for behavior that is largely common to many. Love is redemptive, not punitive. Which is to say, even as Crime, breaking the law happens. Can we find redemption in the mistakes that people make, whether they're criminal or not, and not be overly punitive? Now, again, I, I, you got to beware of the abusers, the warmongers, and the death dealers. I want to find redemption in them the way I find redemption in the wicked who have power is to contend for them to stay alive mm -hmm. while we take their power. Well, That's why I tell some of the wicked people I, I talk to, I don't want you to die. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to be mean and racist and just be that in your own house yeah. by yourself yeah. without any ability to harm anybody else. That's, that's, that's the best I got to give you. I don't want you to die. I'm not one of these people out here who just think we should kill off wicked people. Because there, I say one day I may be a wicked person. My, 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 my foibles, my humanity may become so broken that I just can't stop being wicked to other people. I don't want to be killed off. I want to outlive my wickedness. That's redemptive. There's still some humanity and divinity within everyone, but you ought not have power if you're wicked. You ought to be disempowered. You ought to have the least amount of power. You ought to be able to live in a grassy, greeny area by yourself. <laughs> you just be mean, you just talk to yourself, oh, I hate them, and you just kicking the rocks and kicking the blades of grass. Have at it for the rest of your life. But the moment you become the president, it is my job as a lover of God and humanity to make sure you don't have the power. When you become my supervisor, I don't know what to tell you, man. Don't lose your job in this market. But I am telling you, do what you can to find the good and people without taking their life, without causing harm to them. There is a capacity for redemption. Last thing I'll say, 
Love at its highest form is grounded in mutuality. Beware of the hierarchies. A hierarchy is simply this idea that some lives are inherently more valuable than others. Love at its highest form in human relationships, I believe, must be grounded in mutuality. That is the voluntary, reciprocal, two-way form of giving and receiving love. We must relearn how to have mutual love. Relearn. We must learn how to have mutual love. I can't force someone to love me, and they can't force me to love them. Love has to be mutual, a kind of love that is grounded at its highest form. And that is the kind of love that you enter into powerful relationships, sustainable relationships. My hope and prayer is how can we live out reciprocal and life-giving relationships? So just to recap, love is sacrificial, not exploitative. Love is redemptive and not punitive. Love at its highest form is grounded in mutuality. I'm going to close, but I'm going to read this passage one more time. And I want you to just close your eyes real quick and just let these words wash over you as a description of the kind of love we must learn. And we know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, sacrificial. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another, mutual. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Sacrificial. Little children, let us not love only in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before God whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts. And God knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we now have boldness before God and we receive from God whatever we ask because we obey God's commandments and do what pleases God. And this is God's commandment. And we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, dogma. And love one another, ethics. Just as Jesus has commanded us, all who obey God's commandments abide in God and God abides in them. And by this we know that God abides in us by the spirit that God has given us. God, this is our prayer that we will relearn love. Stand with me, everyone, to your feet, and let's prepare to pray. Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind, or just touch them gently on their elbow or shoulder or just... Make a point of contact with someone. We're just going to take a few moments and just pray. God, I thank you that love covers a multitude of sins. Thank you that perfect love casts out fear. I thank you that love is a spirit. I thank you that love is a gift. And God, we now commit ourselves even the more to relearning, reimagining a love that is often elusive, but a love that we all are seeking. I pray for the person who I'm touching today, someone who may be in need of love, 
someone who may be in need of redemption, who may be in need of mutuality, who may be in need of a love God that is sacrificial. I pray that you'll bless them in a way that is undeniable. I pray, God, that you will infuse life into them. Squeeze their hand gently. I squeeze life. I squeeze hope. I squeeze healing. I squeeze victory. I squeeze the love of God that is within your grasp. May it abide in us the way you abide. May it exist within us the way you exist. May it be shown in the world in ways that are undeniable. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. Now lift your hands. It's me, Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. I need your love, God. Somebody say, I need your love. Lord, I need a love that redeems me. I need a love that continues to transform me. I need a love, God, that causes me to shed the ways of loving that historically have not served us well. I don't want to be a person who gives toxic love. I don't want to be someone who receives toxic love. I want to have a filter by your spirit that will eschew the kind of love that requires violence and dehumanization. And, 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 and harm. I rebuke God every form of love that does not produce life. Even in this room, in this building, in this church, in our service. Lord, I pray that we will love without war. I pray that we will love without violence. I pray we will love without harm. I pray that we will love without becoming monsters for the sake of that which we love. So God, I pray that you will teach us how to love. You may be here today, you say, I need to learn how to love. I need God to love me in a way that helps me to love others better. I need to be more familiar with this loving force that is God. Come and let's pray at the altar for a few moments. You may be in some relationships, you just need God to help you to get out of some places and some spaces and some orientations around love. Come and let's pray. You may have some children, some family members, some, some, some folk that you know I, I, I need a little bit of this love you're talking about to help my love not be manipulative, not be exploitative, not be destructive. It's okay for us to come and let's just seek prayer. We pray together because we know and we trust and believe that God's love can transform us. And when we touch and agree together, we are touching and agreeing and knowing that the love of God is active. It's dynamic. It meets us right where we take a step. We, we know God can meet us in our seat, but we take a step to activate our own faith to say, I know, I believe, I trust God that you are able you're able to transform my conditions and my circumstance. So God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will bless your people who are in need of a relearned love. I wanna relearn it today. I wanna relearn it today. I wanna relearn it today. Lift those hands and let's relearn love. We touch and agree.